Good evening, everyone. Hello and welcome. Or if you are Major John Wu, good morning. I want to thank you all for joining us this evening as we honor our 2020 Hall of Distinguished Alumni inductees and celebrate our sesquicentennial anniversary. My name is Rosa Mejia Cruz, and I serve as Director of Alumni Relations for the college, a role in which I've had the privilege of meeting some incredible scientists and pharmacy professionals who have come through the University of Kentucky. Our alumni, students, and employees are a veritable roster of who's who in the pharmacy world, and our college has built an outstanding reputation for molding the future of pharmacy practice and pharmaceutical sciences. Our alumni live, work, teach, and drive the field of pharmacy in all 50 states and internationally. The college's reach is undeniable and its impact is immeasurable. And tonight, we wanna to celebrate our incredible history while looking ahead to an even brighter future. And although we wish that we were all celebrating in person today, I am encouraged by how well our resilient community has embraced the challenges we all face today. And before I introduce our official MC of the night, Dean Kip Guy, I want to make a few housekeeping announcements. At the conclusion of our official program, we hope you will join us for additional fellowship as we move into smaller breakout rooms. And for those of you who are celebrating a milestone reunion year, you'll have the ability to catch up with your classmates. As the night progresses, you'll have the option of moving into different breakout rooms to say hello to other alumni and friends. And even if it's not your reunion year, we would be delighted if you would stay on and join us. Camera use is encouraged throughout the night and you are welcome to use the chat feature, but please ensure your microphones are muted throughout the entire official program. And lastly, our chief inclusion officer, Dr. Trinika Mitchell will lead us in a toast to our anniversary. So if you've not yet grabbed your preferred beverage, you still have time. And with that, I will introduce Dean Kip Guy. Welcome everybody. So I'm glad we've had as many people join us as have and look forward to at least seeing you on Zoom this evening, hearing a few more stories about your time in the college uh, and enjoying a little bit of time together with our family. So welcome to joining us and getting to experience what our students are doing most days nowadays. At least two thirds of them are seeing their classes through a similar media. So we had a, some requests from people to start off by just catching up to where the college is and uh, giving you some insight into what we've been doing in the middle of the pandemic. So I have a, a few slides to lead you through that. And then we will have a video presentation from our Hall of Distinguished Alumni um, electees after a brief introduction from Dr. Craig Martin. So with that, I'll drive this. All right. So I, I thought as we were starting off, it would be a little bit of fun to take a look at the time the college has been in Lexington, at least. Most of you know we actually started in Louisville in the late 1800s. Uh, but in 1957, moved here to Lexington, to the UK campus per se. And you may not realize this, well, some of you will, but many will not. The college was quite a bit smaller then, about 50 students, of whom four were women in 1957. Um, no graduate program, and about 15 employees. So between then and now, we've grown to 540 students, 344 of whom are women this year. So 66% of our class is female. We have a big and vibrant graduate program now, about 60 graduate students on site right now and have grown to 290 employees or so. So it's a more than tenfold growth for the college between 1957 and 2020. And a lot of interesting firsts from this college. I'll tell you a few of my favorites. So the first woman actually graduated in 1906. 
And if you know anything about the early 1900s, you realize what landmark that really was. Although one suspects it may not have been an intentional landmark uh, when it first happened. At that time, we were delivering a bachelor's. Another big milestone for us was in the late 40s, we had the first racially integrated class. So again, very early starting in to full inclusion and diversity uh, within our body. And graduated our first African-American student in 1958. We helped lead the Farm D revolution starting in the 60s, graduating the first Farm D from the program in 71 and the first all Farm D class in 99. So that's been quite a transition over the years from a bachelor degree uh, to building the residency program to everyone graduating with a Farm D and well over half of them doing residencies after they leave the program. We've had a lot of other firsts, um, first drug information center, first drug product evaluation center, our centers for pharmaceutical technology and outcomes and policy. And this building, which when it was occupied, well, I'm not actually in the building, nor am I in the middle of Raven's Run doing this, although that would be fun. That building was the largest pharmacy educational building in the country. So lots of firsts and we hope to keep continuing those as we go on. And here we go. So I wanna talk a little bit about education in, the, in this current year. Um, couple things that have been going on here I wanna let you know about. So after a letter writing campaign from the deans, which involved many of the 140 plus schools now, we were able to get NABP to agree to make the PACOA exam optional for our students in the middle of the pandemic. So they didn't have to add another large stressful uh, standardized exam uh, to their lives. And we've chosen to opt out of that so our students will be avoiding that exam this year. I'm sure they're quite happy about it. And I just want to reassure everyone, we still push them just as hard as we ever have. So they'll graduate and all pass the boards just like normal. We've added a lot of career support to the college, both for our PharmD students and our graduate students in recognition of the challenges we're seeing now and in the market and in career progression beyond the first job. So things like CV review and board review, uh, we help graduate students with tools like Strength Finders, and we've added multiple levels of mentoring to the programs, including prepping for residencies, so that students are best prepared to get the residency they want, if that's what they choose to do when they leave the program. And we've also worked really hard to build stronger connection to alumni and other members of the community so our students can really reach out one-on-one, -on -one, learn what jobs really are like, and have a data set to drive their choices about their careers. So an example of that is the coffee conversations our PhD students are able to do now, which is a virtual, like everything else in 2020, experience where they talk directly to somebody who has a job they might be interested in taking. Uh, many of you have interacted with Rosa over the last year and a half as we've rebuilt the alumni database so that we're able to find you and ask you to help with mentorship and help students who want to understand exactly what your job is like. And if we haven't touched you already, I'll, I'm sure we will. Uh, we try to connect everybody in our community uh, to enable everybody to do well. We've had equal progress in practice advancement. And I particularly wanted to focus on something we're pushing now, which is growing affiliate residency programs, not just in hospital systems, but in the community setting and in regional hospitals and in other health systems across the Commonwealth and wider. So we're now up to 11 affiliate programs and continue to grow that. Train a total of 642 residents. Now our non-UK residents still don't get an R number. So you're safe if you're a suppository holder. 
uh, in the sanctrosect nature of that program. But just to give you an idea of the scope of this, we're up to 530 plus preceptors now. So voluntary faculty who help our students with experiential education. Um, this is a huge effort uh, in coordination and in our alumni and friends who help the college directly in this way. And one major change we made this year, uh, just as we were leaving the building physically was to appoint our first chief practice officer Brooke Hudspeth, who is a graduate program and who joined us from Kroger. Uh, and Brooke jumped in with both feet, despite actually not having sat down with me directly in our offices since her interview. And one of the things Brooke has done is to pull together a collaborative program at UK that is aiming to vaccinate for flu every student, faculty member, and staff member in the university. So that's almost 50,000 vaccinations to be delivered. And she's done that by building a collaborative team that includes the University Health System, UK Healthcare and Kroger, as well as our college and the College of Nursing, all together to be able to deliver those vaccinations. And you may have heard about this on the news this evening as they were just announcing the president has mandated the flu vaccine for students at the University of Kentucky this year. That's a, a big step forward in delivering practice directly to our larger community here in Lexington. So I'll give you some tidbits about how COVID went. I'm gonna give you the, the good ones and the happy moments. So just rest assured it's been a struggle for everybody just like it is off the campus. And we've all been working really hard to, to navigate this situation. So when we learned about the university moving away from face-to-face -face instruction in the spring, within 12 days, we pivoted from that notice to delivering our curriculum online and through hybrid approaches. And every piece of that curriculum from face-to-face -face class to group sessions, to pace lab, to experiential, and right on out the door through Appies. So this was a massive effort. It took every one of our faculty stepping up to do it. And frankly, it took a huge draw on the local community to be able to ensure that we were still able to place students in experiential uh, placements in particular as we went through the spring and the summer. So that was successful. Our first focus was really getting our fourth year students out the door, graduated on time, and we were able to do that and then turn right around over the summer when usually we're having a lighter load and get ready to deliver the curriculum now in a planned intentional way through this mode and also ready to handle the IPI and API rotations for the students uh, across our entire network. This was not only a lot of hard work, but moments every week where we saw people's agility and creativity just bubble up and we saw people step up to do things that certainly were on their job description in order to be sure that everyone was able to get through the program on time. And I think it, it really was the Kentucky way distilled down into a few stressful months. Um, whatever needed to get done, got done. We did it well. We delivered the producibles that we needed to deliver. So the educational plan that our educational office built um, including the hybrid classrooms, wound up serving as a template for many of the other colleges at UK. We finished our plan first. We handed it out free to anybody who wanted to take a look at it. And we kept right on participating with everyone else on the campus in understanding how to adapt each different type of curriculum. Obviously, fine arts is far different instructionally from pharmacy. Um, but we kept that connection everywhere across the campus into the full community to pass on what we learn and to learn from other people uh, as well. And at the same time, we were active in other parts of the response to uh, the COVID epidemic, including the leadership teams, the Stark Committee, which has governed how the campus has responded procedurally, uh, and the Cure Alliance, which has driven a lot of the therapeutic interventions and protocols and uh, clinical trials here. 
So a couple specific examples we're particularly proud of. We partnered up early with the Gem Beam Institute, Ag and Engineering to produce and bottle and deliver hand sanitizer for UK healthcare, for other partners in the local area and for institutions that needed access to that, particularly early in the pandemic when you couldn't find it anywhere. Since we started doing that, we've delivered over 2000 gallons of bottled hand sanitizer, which is a pretty amazing amount if you think about it. And that was an effort driven by several of our faculty and largely handled physically by our students. Uh, at the same time, we participated in the Kentucky hotline for COVID um, and in enabling access to COVID testing uh, all over uh, the Commonwealth, but particularly in this area. And you can see a little bit of press over here on the bottom right hand corner. We got called out for the hand sanitizer project by the governor during one of his uh, daily briefings. We also conceived the idea of getting masks to everyone who needed them, uh, including not only our faculty and students, all of whom got two masks in order to enable them to come back and function uh, as we re-enrolled, uh, but also all of our alumni. So we were the first college to do this and the only one to deliver them fully across our entire uh, family. And we got a few extra people into the family. So if you don't recognize this man in the bottom right hand corner, that's Steve Stack who runs public health for the Commonwealth wearing one of our masks uh, at his briefing. So I've caught it on him wearing it a couple of times since he got it and we're quite proud to have that out there. We've done a lot of other things as part of this pandemic response. I'll just call out a couple of them. Uh, Frank Romanelli helped organize a regional meeting every Sunday evening where we invite in speakers from areas that are currently experiencing heavy COVID case volumes to learn from them, hear their experiences, be able to talk through with practitioners from all over the region, what are best practices. Um, that's been a great opportunity, not only to hear what's going on internationally, nationally, and locally, but really to be able to informally coordinate across all the practitioners in the area what uh, we're gonna do. Frank and I and several other people in the college helped to coordinate a number of early clinical trials and wish them into a single uh, adaptive trial design that was really aimed at rapidly assessing potential therapies for COVID uh, and getting them into more elaborate, larger uh, proof of concept clinical trials if they showed any uh, potential um, positive effect or and preferably not negative side effects. So that's been going ongoing uh, quite a while. To give you an idea what that was like, we wrote and got that trial approved in six weeks. Um, I, I have never in my life put together a clinical protocol that quickly. Uh, I doubt I ever will again. Um, and I certainly doubt the FDA will turn it around as rapidly uh, as they did. So that was really an experience to, uh, to bring everybody together and to do that in that time frame. Uh, and it's running and accruing in the Kentucky Clinic right now. We collaborated with Sullivan and KPHA in order to produce best practices documents for uh, community pharmacy in particular, uh, and to keep that a living document and updated as practices changed over time. That was actually one of the first things that Brooke Hudspeth drove when she joined us as chief practice officer. So that's been a great collaboration and an important impact the college has had on local practice. Um, and we didn't quit doing our day jobs while we were handling this. So thanks to the generosity of a lot of people on this call uh, and many of our other friends and family, we were able to close our portion of the UK development and philanthropy campaign in the middle of the pandemic. Um, and we were one of the first three colleges to do that. So if you helped, thank you. If you didn't help, well, you can send a check to Mary Beth later this evening and feel a little less guilt about uh, not directly supporting us. I'm joking, you all support us wonderfully well. I just wanna make one last comment. Many of you know we've been experiencing several essentially equivalent ongoing problems 
in the country, one of which has been a lot of social unrest around race relations, in particular around the Black Lives Matter movement and how that's intersected with the rest of our society. We've also had a national recession and an unbelievable level of unemployment together with the pandemic. So I just wanted to fill you in on what we've been doing with respect to trying to improve diversity and inclusion in the college. It's been a, a focal area the last couple of years. So we appointed Trinika Miller as our first assistant dean for diversity, equity, and inclusion. She spent the last year really mapping out what we've been doing in the college and where we would like to go and facilitating a lot of discussions amongst all of our stakeholders, all the different ways you can imagine uh, talking to one another, trying to understand where we're all coming from and where we need to go. And as a part of that, we're starting really to make some substantive changes in the way uh, we deal, particularly with supporting students from underrepresented groups. I really wanna make a shout out to Tradika for insisting and continuing to focus on the whole range of what underrepresented means. So in our eyes, that can mean age, veteran status, whether you're from a rural area or a first generation college student, in addition to race, gender, ethnicity, and other issues that often make the news more um, than some of these. So things we're doing for sure this year that we're committed to implementing now are increasing the training for everyone, including students, faculty, and staff, on how to talk to one another effectively, have difficult conversations, how to be allies and support one another when times are tough for your group, and how to ask for that support when you need it, and how to be not only not racist, but anti-racist, how to appreciate race and diversity and support people when they need that support by propping them up and by calling people when they do things they shouldn't do. We're also really tailoring our support systems to match needs of underrepresented groups. And this is something I think we hadn't really appreciated that from the administrative side, that students have substantially different needs. And you can imagine that if you're a first gen student or as I am a rural student and map that over to other underrepresented groups. We need to be able to support people the way they need to be supported to ensure that they're successful to the best of their ability. And one of the things we realized we didn't have was scholarship support for economically disadvantaged students from underrepresented minority groups. So this has become a fundraising goal for the college. And I'm pleased to announce we are endowing the first scholarship for black students will be the Harriet Marble Scholarship. Uh, and this will be available for a four year period for single student in the college. Um, it's named after, if you don't recognize the name of Harriet Beecher Stone Marble, the first black woman pharmacist to practice in Lexington. I encourage you to look her up after we're done tonight. She had an amazing life story. Um, not only did she run an independently owned pharmacy in Lexington, but she was a music producer here and had an enormous impact on the community in many other ways. Those of you who know me will know that music and pharmacy are two of my deepest loves. So I'm really glad that we're able to name this scholarship after Harriet. And I'll leave it there and not bother on any longer. Pass over virtually to Craig. What's one word you would use to describe University of Kentucky College of Pharmacy? And the word that I would use is quite simply excellence. I would say exciting. Home. Um, I need all the words. So four years of ups, downs, lefts, rights. One word wouldn't do it justice, so dictionary. I didn't even apply to anywhere else. <laughs> I put all people laugh at that today. You only apply to UK. What if you didn't get in? I'm like, I didn't give it a thought. I'm here at Kentucky because Kentucky was my state, and I'm glad that it was. We are here to celebrate six University of Kentucky College of Pharmacy alumni. 
The 2020 inductees are Young Alumni Award winners Ashley Mattingly and John Wu, as well as Lifetime Achievement Award winners Bill Krauthamel, Trish Freeman, Lynn Harrelson, and Don Latender. This uh, shorter, uh, very pleasant, a uh, big smile on his face gentleman came up and said, uh, asked me the same question. He said, are you interested in the UK uh, uh, pharmacy residency? And I said, uh, no, sir, I know, not that I'm not interested, but I don't know anything about it. So at that point, he stuck his hand out and he said, hi, I'm Paul Parker, and let's have a chat. And that moment in time changed my life. Dr. Ashley Mattingly. I chose the University of Kentucky College of Pharmacy because not only is it one of the top pharmacy schools in the country and has produced some of the leading experts in the field that I knew I would get the best education possible, which would prepare me for my future career as a pharmacist, but also because of the strong connection to its graduates. All of the graduates that I spoke to still had strong connections to the college, and it was clear that when you are a graduate of the, of the program, you are part of the family and are always welcome back. When I started pharmacy school, I had already been working at a hospital pharmacy as a technician for a few years, and I knew that I was going to practice in a hospital when I graduated. Well, I'm not in a hospital anymore, so I would encourage my past self to build strong relationships with faculty and explore all of the potential directions a doctor of pharmacy degree could take me, and to seek out new opportunities and to gain experience in these different pathways. A pharmacy degree is so versatile, and one from the University of Kentucky College of Pharmacy will prepare you for opportunities and open doors that you never would have thought of. I would like to thank the University of Kentucky College of Pharmacy for this amazing honor. I'm humbled to be included as a young, distinguished alumni. I would also like to thank my husband, Joey Mattingly, who has always supported and encouraged me in whatever I do and continues to challenge me to grow. I would also like to thank my faculty mentor, Cynthia Boyle. She has provided me amazing advice over the years and has continued to support and encourage me in my career. Thank you. Major John Wu. Good morning from Okinawa, Japan. I'm currently stationed at Kadena Air Base and I could not pass up the opportunity to showcase the endless beauty of where we'll be serving for the next three years. Uh, we've had three typhoons in the past four weekends and a minor earthquake, uh, but the number of beaches and ramen and sushi restaurants rivals the numbers of pharmacies in the United States, so I think I'll survive. Um, I am more than humbled to accept this distinction from the University of Kentucky College of Pharmacy. Um, as a Kentucky native, uh, and being a lifelong bleeder of blue, UK was the obvious choice for my pharmacy education. Uh, and I've always loved the philosophy that you are the sum of who you surround yourself with. Um, so we all know that UK has the best students, the best staff, and the best alumni, so that made it an obvious choice as well. I'm also relatively budget conscious, um, so the in-state tuition was also a pretty big factor in making my decision for me. Um, while we're on the topic of surrounding yourself with the best people, um, advice I would give to my past self would be to prune yourself and make yourself better just a little bit each day. It doesn't have to be much, but at least you're improving yourself each day, that's, that's the goal. Um, and I thought it'd be nice to throw in a little pharmacy analogy since my past self probably would have been studying for block exams and stressing out about that. Um, but I relate it to medication therapy management. So a couple points from there. Um, number one, weed out the duplicate therapies. Are you spending too much time doing the same thing, expecting a different result? Um, number two, weed out only treating the side effects. Are you focusing on the wrong problems? Um, number three, weed out um, insufficient and overdoses. Are you having good balance between your work life and your personal life? Are you eating enough, sleeping enough, exercising too much, too little? Um, and then finally, weed out the dangers of having multiple prescribers. So are you allowing yourself to think too highly of what other people think about you? Are you focusing too much on pleasing everybody versus taking time out to take care of yourself? Life is too short and we're not guaranteed to see tomorrow. Um, recently in my professional and personal life, I've had to deal with losses of cherished ones. Um, and the only thing that got me through those times without slipping into despair was focusing on all the memories that we got to create um, versus all the memories that we didn't. Be the genuine reason why somebody smiles when they think about you. 
Make time for your loved ones. We're in a time now where we are so connected socially. So take advantage of that and be confident in your ability to be positive. I also need to give all the thanks. Um, thank you to the people that nominated me, that selected me. Thank you to my teachers who um, believed in me enough to write those Air Force recommendation letters to start my professional career. Um, class of 2010, thank you to anyone who complimented me on my ridiculous dance moves. Um, the back row Sudoku racers, uh, my Appy battle, battle Buddies, um, anybody tagged in a photo on Facebook on September 7th, 2008. Um, and to my roommate and lifelong friend, thank you guys. Um, to my parents and my brother who have supported me. Um, and to this guy, to my wife and kids um, who literally traveled, moved halfway across the world in the middle of a pandemic to continue supporting me. Thank you guys. Um, so in my pharmacy career, I have been blessed to be able to marry my best friend on top of the Empire State Building. I've met and received a presidential coin from former President Obama for my work in Afghanistan, making sure our warriors made it home safely to their families. Um, I've led 600 medics and supporting 600,000 spectators across two United States Air Force air shows. Um, and recently I was named in 2018 the Senior Excellence Leader Award um, across 17 different medical specialties across the entire Department of Defense. But tomorrow, in my lobby, for my patients, I'm just the pharmacist. And that just goes to show you, every day is full of opportunities. To not only fill yourself with people that make you better, people that will call your stupid ideas stupid, people that will bring you joy, but it's also an opportunity, especially on a world of eight billion people, and as pharmacists, to fill the lives of your patients with experiences that they can look back on and smile upon. It's not gonna happen all the time, can you imagine if it did? Dr. William Krauthammel. Good evening. Uh, certainly my pleasure to be here tonight uh, as being part of the Hall of Distinguished Alumni at the University of Kentucky. It's certainly a privilege. It's uh, great to be here even though we're doing it virtually. But I do have my UK uh, mask here in case we need it. So I uh, just thought I'd share that to you. Uh, but I'd much rather be in Lexington. Such a fantastic place to be, but as it turns out, this is uh, great too. So uh, how did I end up with the College of Pharmacy at the University of Kentucky? It's kind of a, a long story, but the, the short story is that my major professor, Jim Delucio, was at the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy, and I was in my second year of graduate school. He transferred over to University of Kentucky, and uh, eventually I went there too. But the longer story is that it was a bit more of a circuitous route. It started out that in my second year, um, as we were starting to finish up, uh, Dr. DeLucio said that he was moving to the University of Kentucky to uh, help set up their new program. But unfortunately, the program wasn't set up yet, so I wouldn't be able to join the program. I could, in fact, uh, go to another department temporarily, either chemistry or pharmacology, but uh, it wasn't clear how soon the program would be set up. So the other options were to uh, find someone else at Philadelphia College of Pharmacy, where I had gotten my undergraduate degree as well, uh, or to look for another place to go. So I decided to take Dr. Uh, Delucio's advice and go to the University of uh, the, uh, Virginia Commonwealth University now. It had been Medical College of Virginia at the time, School of Pharmacy, and uh, work with Dr. Martin, who was his major professor. So I, we actually did go there, and uh, as the first year I was there was waning, uh, Dr. Martin said he was taking a deanship at, university, at Temple University in Philadelphia, and, uh, but unfortunately, he wouldn't be taking any graduate students with him. So uh, I then called up Dr. Delicio, and he said the program was almost ready to go out there. So I ended up transferring back to the University of Kentucky and uh, finishing out there. So that was, uh, that was how I ended up there. It was actually quite an experience. 
and uh, but you never know how life, life will turn out. It turned out to be a great experience and I certainly uh, am glad that it turned out that way. Uh, it was always an exciting place to be. There were the new young faculty coming in and they had a lot of energy. They brought with them a lot of new ideas. There was uh, you know, just a lot of new program ideas, uh, new technologies, and certainly the young faculty who were coming in was uh, Joe Swintoski and we did it for Smith Klein and French in Philadelphia, Jim Delucio from PCP and Harry Kostenbader from Temple. And they were the people who were coming in to set up the program along with several other young faculty as well. Blue Diamond are coming in and also uh, several other people as well, George DeGenis. So it was a very exciting place. So when I went to you know, West Virginia University on faculty, I was teaching a new area of uh, pharmacokinetics, drug metabolism, uh, biopharmaceutics. But in the beginning of my second year there, as the year was about to start in the fall, the faculty member who was teaching pharmacy practice uh, decided to leave and really left the school high and dry because they didn't have anybody to teach their, the final uh, pharmacy technology course of the compounding, making elixirs and tablets and things like that which was going to be on the state board. So it was certainly very important. So they were trying to figure out, what could we do? And I said, me, <laughs> I'm available. I pulled out all my notes, all of my uh, prescription pads from Dr. Leshev's course that I was a TA in. And uh, that turned out really well. I was able to teach the course the whole year. I learned a lot myself from it, uh, both from the teaching perspective and the perspective that uh, you never know uh, throughout your life, but things will be important. Sometimes things that you think won't be important turn out to be important and uh, vice versa. So this was an example of something I thought was something I was just doing, but it turned out to be uh, very important, uh, for, certainly for the students, because they needed that final year in order to pass their state boards. So um, I'd like to thank some people, though, for the opportunities I had there. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank my wife, uh, she certainly did a lot, she put up with a lot as a graduate student. Uh, I was uh, basically taking courses during the day and also working as a teaching assistant several days a week. Uh, then I was doing research at night, and on the weekends I was a weekend pharmacist at Central Baptist Hospital. So uh, I often would, would roll in late at night because a lot of my experiments which I was doing would run into like 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning. So I'd roll in late at, late at night and have to get up early the next morning to go in for class or, or for a lab. So I uh, certainly appreciate that very much. Um, other people, I'd like to thank the people on my committee, uh, all of which who helped out. Uh, Dr. Uh, Delicio, uh, Dittert, uh, Kostenbader, uh, Lou Diamond. They were all really important. And also uh, the head of the chemistry department, who rescued me when, uh, at the end of my uh, program, when some things uh, weren't exactly working out. The problem was that since I was the first student going through the program, everything was new. So everything was a, a trial balloon, and uh, something most things worked out. Everything we eventually figured out, but there were certainly a lot of things that uh, had to uh, be a work in progress. So I really appreciated. Uh, the head of chemistry for rescuing me there at the last minute. <clears throat> um, so that's basically what uh, I have to say today. It was a very important uh, program. I certainly very much so respect getting this award. It's a great award and uh, I thank you all for doing it. Lynn Harrelson. How did I end up at the University of Kentucky College of Pharmacy. My first day of school in first grade, my parents met me and walked me home. I was told at that time that I was going to college. That was my goal through grade school, junior high, and my senior high school. I planned to go to a university in my home state, 
In my senior year of high school, a lot of things changed. My plans fell apart. Instead, we were living here in Kentucky and I uh, ended up going to a community college outside my hometown. There I worked under a work study program as a lot of students did. I worked in the Dean's office along with the Dean's staff and with the administrative office. One day I was in the admission officer's office and she asked, Ms. Harrelson, what are you going to do with your higher education? What are your plans? I shared with her some of the challenges I was looking at and she did not miss a beat. She said, well, this year we can get loans, scholarships and grants for women. And then she listed a number of majors, one of which was pharmacy. I had a flashback about the care a pharmacist had helped us with when I was 14, helping us care for my grandfather. My mother and her sister were caring for him while he continued to be at home. And this individual was very, very helpful. I thought, what better way for me to honor not only my grandfather, but an individual who had helped us take care of him. That is why I chose pharmacy. I'm here at Kentucky because Kentucky was my state. What advice would I give my younger self? The advice that I would give my younger self is prepare for change. Prepare for change. Prepare for change. It's going to come. It's going to come more and more rapidly. More and more avenues are going to be open for today's practitioners, but you need to be prepared to meet those uh, opportunities and the changes that are the result of those opportunities. Be a part of the change so you can uh, model the profession and the practice in a way that you want it to be that is best for you, the profession, and the patients that we serve. Dr. Trish Ripto Freeman. When it came time to go to college, people said, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I'm going to pharmacy school. I mean, there was, it, it's interesting, you know, as a mother now, my kids were trying to decide what they wanted to do. And they said, mom, how did you decide pharmacy? And I said, I don't even remember making a decision. It was just, I'm going to go to pharmacy school because that's, you know, what Papa does. And that's what I'm going to do is I'm going to be a pharmacist. And so at the time I came to pharmacy school, I really thought I would come to pharmacy school and then I would go home and and take over and work at Smith Drug for my grandpa. And you come to pharmacy school and you know things change and one of the things that happened to me during pharmacy school was um, I started tutoring. Um, and, and I was tutoring friends and you know I would have and I was having a great time and, and I would have friends that were in pharmacy school with me and they would say, you, you explain that so well, you are such a good teacher. You should go, you should be a teacher. You should teach in pharmacy school. And I was like, no, you know. Um, but, but ultimately, you know, multiple things happened and the next thing I know I find myself in graduate school because I'm going to be a faculty member and, and teach. And so here I am. One of the, the things that I have worked really in my course that I teach, um, where I teach a, our public health and policy course, and I really work with the students and try to get them to, to think about, okay, how, how are you going to take care of, here's a patient with diabetes who comes in, here's a patient with asthma, let's talk about these different situations. You're the, you know, the pharmacist, you're going to provide this care, you're going to impact public health by, you know, decreasing complications, and, you know, we're going to have a lower rate of foot amputations because of, of your care. Should we not be doing the same thing so that we have, we decrease our overdose mortality? I mean, and, and so trying to get them to, to recognize, you know, that chronic disease is chronic disease is chronic disease. And it's our role to, to treat chronic disease. What, what would you hope that um, students and colleagues would remember about your work? that I made a difference. I made a difference in their lives and in the lives of people in Kentucky, in their communities, through, through, my, through my work and my advocacy. Dr. Donald Latender. 
Actually, my journey to Kentucky was quite serendipitous. At the behest of a family member, I attended the SHP Midyear Clinical Meeting in December 1975. I had my eyes actually set on independent ownership in the small town in southeastern Massachusetts in which I was raised. Uh, but the family member persuaded me to go to Washington, D.C. to attend the meeting. And at the meeting, I just happened to be walking along a corridor and noticed a tabletop display with a picture of thoroughbred horses. Back in those days, the residency showcase, as you know it today, did not exist. It was just a series of small tabletops with uh, very small displays promoting the very few residencies that existed at that time. In all honesty, I didn't know what a residency in pharmacy was. As I approached the table, a gentleman, distinguished looking gentleman, turns out it was John Butler, the former associate director of pharmacy, came up and asked me if I needed help. And I said, no, uh, I, I didn't. He asked me if I was interested in a residency and I looked at him quizzically and said, what's a, what's a pharmacy residency? Uh, and in any event, we had a very brief exchange, but towards the end of our exchange, this uh, shorter, uh, very pleasant, uh, big smile on his face gentleman came up and said, uh, asked me the same question. He said, are you interested in the UK uh, uh, pharmacy residency? And I said, uh, no, sir, I know, not that I'm not interested, but I don't know anything about it. So at that point, he stuck his hand out and he said, hi, I'm Paul Parker, and let's have a chat. And that moment in time changed my life. Uh, from there, I spent the next hour, hour and a half with Paul, talking about Kentucky, talking about this new thing that I knew nothing about called clinical pharmacy, uh, and how it was gonna transform our profession in terms of uh, patient care and uh, educational delivery. It's easy to look in the rearview mirror and see how Paul's vision regarding both pharmacist intervention and patient care and clinical education uh, might have evolved, but to think that he was talking about this in the late 50s and, and 60s, and, and here I came along in the early 70s, uh, is just quite extraordinary to have been uh, young in my career to have met Paul at that point in time. I applied to the program at the behest of Paul, having no uh, idea whatsoever of the large number of people that would apply and uh, that only 12 would be selected. Uh, but it, there was a very large number I turned out, uh, found out later. And, uh, but I was privileged enough to be among the 12 chosen to uh, come into the program starting uh, July 1, 19, so, <clears throat> in 1976. <clears throat> Pardon me. Those three years at Kentucky were extraordinary. Bob Rapp, Chan Pecoro, Kurt Johnson was a newly graduated resident and now an early faculty member. Tom Foster the year before him. So Tom was also a very young faculty member at the time and many others who contributed to our education and training. It was just an extraordinary time to be part of a program that, that wasn't fearful of taking any steps to help promote and develop this thing called clinical pharmacy. I feel so privileged to have been part of the program in its early stages of development so that I could grow uh, personally and professionally along with the program. I went to the University of Kansas as my first position and then found my way likely, largely at the, at the direction of Paul uh, to be, become the first director of clinical services for this thing called the American Society of Hospital Pharmacists, where I, I had serendipitously uh, gone, uh, as I mentioned earlier. And, uh, and then that grew into my responsibilities for helping to build residencies nationwide, which I spent the next 19 years doing. Uh, so uh, taking that chance was really something that Paul promoted. Uh, and then I took another leap of faith 19 years later when I became Dean at the University of Rhode Island and then subsequently Dean at, at Iowa. I, I just um, learned a lot from my colleagues there, uh, my professors and, and, and clinical instructors there 
about the importance of taking a leap of faith. And so I owe a lot to Kentucky in that regard and would likewise urge uh, those of you that are starting out your career to believe in your abilities, uh, not doubt that, and be willing to take some chances uh, in opportunities that present themselves in your professional journey. Hey, well, I want to come, I want to close with some comments about Paul, but before I do that, there are some very special people in my life that I need to thank. First and foremost, my, my, my bride, Louise. Uh, she and I met in high school. Uh, we got married shortly before I came to Kentucky. Uh, she's a registered nurse. And during those days, we made the hefty sum of $4,600 a year as a resident. And quite frankly, uh, if not for Louise and her earning potential, I would have likely lived on peanut butter and jelly for the better part of three years, uh, like many of my single uh, colleagues did. Uh, but, but we got along just fine, and I owe a tremendous degree of, of credit to Louise in helping me get through the program and then supporting me throughout my professional career. She's also the mother of our four children, and uh, I want to give a shout out to uh, the, um, my four children, our four children, Allison, Jacob, Philip, and Matthew, who have all gone on and lead uh, highly successful professional careers themselves and have been supportive of dad uh, in the course of his own uh, professional journey. So to my immediate family, Louise and our four children, thank you from the bottom of my heart. I'd like to close uh, as I started with a message about Paul. Uh, for those of you that are on this Zoom session uh, and never had the privilege of getting to know Paul, you missed one of the most extraordinary human beings ever to grace the halls of pharmacy. He was a visionary. He was a politician. He was a, a kind and gentle person, but he was also someone who poked and prodded you. He was the most Socratic teacher I ever encountered in my life. Frequently, he did not make declarative statements. Rather, he asked you questions such as, how did you improve patient care today? He was known uh, among the residents to ask that question of all of us, which caused us to take pause and say, well, yeah, how did we improve patient care today? Paul was the consummate servant leader. It was not about Paul. It was about everybody else. And one thing I learned in, in the process of being educated and trained at Kentucky that has never left me is it's not about me. It's about those that we serve educationally, scientifically, and in patient care. And that has helped drive me throughout my professional career. So I want to close by thanking Paul, thanking for him, thanking him for helping me to pivot at a crucial point in my life and literally lead me in a direction that I had no knowledge about, uh, no thoughts of, uh, no aspirations about, but by virtue of listening to that man for 90 minutes, he literally changed my life in the direction of my life. So I want to give a, an enormous shout out to him because quite frankly, without Paul and without that serendipitous meeting that we had all over a picture of thoroughbred horses, I would not have this distinct privilege of having been considered for the, for the distinguished uh, hall of, of alumni in the UK College of Pharmacy. Once again, I'm deeply, deeply humbled and appreciative of this distinction and this honor. It means more to me than I can adequately put into words. Thank you all, my Kentucky colleagues, for this very special recognition. It touches me and my family very deeply. I do bleed Kentucky blue. And in that regard, I'll close simply with go Wildcats. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'll, let's take a moment to just congratulate um, everyone who's honored tonight. I've seen a lot of people say things in the chat, but I'm a believer that you give people their flowers while they can still see them and smell them. So uh, let's give them a round of very far away applause. Okay, so take give a second to do that, so. All right.
thank y'all for doing that because they are definitely very deserving. So before we go into the toast, I've been giving a very uh, big thing to ask you to do. It's one of the most important things you'll ever do for the UK College of Pharmacy. Um, it's critical. It's a life-changing decision that you will now um, be able to participate in. We need each of you, every single one of you, to help us name our horse. Okay, so we challenge our students uh, to come up with some names for our horse that's in the atrium. Um, hopefully at some point you'll be able to go by and visit the horse. And we promise them um, some really great UK College of Pharm Pharmacy goodies if they won as far as they were the name winner. So we want each of you, each of our alumni, each of our friends to help pick the winner, which can be found in the poll that should be popping up on your screen right now. Y'all didn't know y'all were making such big decisions tonight. Feel free to vote and to submit. I know this is the biggest decision you'll make in your lifetime. I know, but we appreciate you for helping us out. Okay, it seems like people have made their votes. I'm not quite sure how we're gonna share that. So I think Rosa may tell us if it'll be announced later. There we go. Oh man, it's close. So it looks like beyond the script one, I'm sure Christy Cologne will be proud um, for pinning that for all of us at the College of Pharmacy. I will like to give I would like to give a shout out though to Rosa who came up with the Kippy Guy. She really, you know, I had faith in that name and I know she's a little disappointed that it didn't win. Um, but let me just say to everyone else, thank you for not voting for Kippy Guy. <laughs> I'm you know, sometimes that's what leaders do, you know, Dr. Guy. But anyway, so looks like Beyond the Script is the name of our horse. So I'm excited about that. Now let's uh, go to what uh, my main job is, is to kind of give the toast. Now, I, I love a lot of things about the UK College of Pharmacy. And one of the major things that I love is irony and diversity that we have. So let's talk about diversity. So, and the irony that kind of goes together. The person that's giving the toast, which would be me, I am an old Miss grad, hotty toddy. Okay, so if you, and if you don't know who the team is, the team, if who my, School is the team that UK played last week in football, and I appreciate the results other people may not have. So uh, diversity and uh, and uh, things like that. And then finally, the biggest irony of it all is I do not drink, but um, I have no judgment of people who do. So when you raise that glass, I don't need to know what's in it. Feel free to fill it with whatever you like. Um, I will tell you that mine is water, but there are no judgments coming from this place. I am an inclusive individual. All right, so let me go ahead with the toast that we have. All right, so I would like to say that we are extremely thankful to our students, alumni, which we just you know heard some great things from, employees, mentors, preceptors, donors, friends. It takes so much um, to uh, keep a place that the UK College of Pharmacy running, and we have such pride in all that you've done, and people just contribute daily to our legacy and to our excellence. We recognize all the hours that are spent in the lab, uh, you know, developing drugs and determining ways that we can greater serve um, our nation and our people um, in the lecture halls. So thank you to all the 
professors who are teaching, some you know going in face to face, and so we appreciate that. And then we think about the students who are learning there as well and putting through their their best effort, um, whether it's physically in the lecture hall or virtually these days, in offices, study rooms, Zoom, which has become the friend and detriment to us all, I think. Um, we appreciate it, but there are times we wish we could kind of hide from it for a little while. And, you know, the clinics, pharmacies um, throughout, you know, because we're doing really great patient care. And then even we have to thank Speedway, right? Because there are times uh, when we don't have time to run across the street to the hospital. Or if you're like me, I never remember to, uh, to, bring, to bring lunch. And so thank you Speedway because they can go across there to grab something really quickly. And um, we wanna honor our frontline workers, um, the working parents, all the value researchers that we have, our local and international pharmacy heroes. Our community is truly exceptional and has made great sacrifices to stay true to our critical missions of bold education, innovative research, patient-centered practice, community service, and then I would love to add to this the diversity and inclusion that we're really growing to embrace. Together we can and will um, overcome any obstacle. As we look to our future, I can only imagine where the next 150 years will take our pharmacy family. And I, for one, am filled with immense hope and gratitude for everyone who has helped us get to where we are. Please raise your glass, your cup, your bottle, whatever that may be, um, to 150 years of excellence and to the next generations of leaders, innovators, and visionaries to go and beyond the script and to our new horse.